Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Happy Hanukkah! Festive Kwanzaa! Wonderful winter solstice! Ramadan? Let's have some fun! This is Scott Aller, VP of Marketing at Core Software. You're listening to Promoter 101. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. I have brought 12 new interviews for all the good boys and girls. Merry Christmas. Now here are my good worker elves, Dan and Luke. (laughs) Thanks, Santa. It's Promoter 101. It's our 12 Days of Christmas special. We've got a surprise interview every day from December 20th through the 31st. I'm Dan Steinberg, and now unveiling our surprise guest of the day, Mr. Luke Pierce. Luke? Dan, thank you very much, and a happy holidays to everybody listening on Promoter 101. Today, it's the 12 Days of Christmas, day one, and we're going to be featuring a very special guest, Move Concerts, Phil Rodriguez, who's here today sharing his success as a concert promoter in South America. Hey, this is Rob Zaffarelli. Patty Ann Tarleton. Paul Lohr. Phil Rodriguez. Rick Greenstein. Renatas Nachayos. Drew Pellet. Rich Mills. Sasha Bombaji. Seth Hurwitz. Steve Martin. Whitney Bond. This is Trip Brown. Wayne Forte. Steve Zapp. Trevor Solomon. Be live on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. We continue our world tour. Catch us when we come to a town near you. Next on deck for Promoter 101, we'll be live at the FlyCon Conference in the Big Easy, New Orleans, January 16th at 2 p.m. We'll be recording Promoter 101 live with a special guest from Lockin and the Brooklyn Bowl, Mr. Peter Shapiro. Looking forward to it, Dan. Yeah, and you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at the Jew. The show's at Promoters 101, and it's plural, Promoters with an S, 101. And you can always catch Luke at W. Luke Pierce. Of course, it's Dan and I talking every week. You hear enough of us, but it doesn't have to be that way. We're ready to listen. Send us an email with your ideas to steiny at promoter101.net. We can't wait to hear what's on your mind, and we give you our sworn promise to respond to every inquiry in a timely manner because you matter to us. Bob Rupp here on Promoter 101. Dan, it is day one of the 12 days of Christmas of Promoter 101, but we're going to do a little bridged version of the news. It's been a short week since we recorded our last podcast on Friday, so not a whole lot to talk about today. But there are a couple of things we should talk about because there is a little bit going on in the world. It's not like everybody in the world stopped working after the proverbial holiday begins Friday before Christmas. So this week, we got a few things we want to touch on. We'll start here. Michael Swear, the co-owner of Bowery Ballroom and Mercury Lounge, is joining Live Nation to create Mercury East Presents, a New York-branded promoter company. The move comes nearly a year after AG purchased Bowery Presents and eight months after AG joined Brooklyn Sports Entertainment to buy Webster Hall, as reported by our buddy Dave Brooks at Billboard. Dan, what are you thinking about this? It's big news in New York City. You knew Live Nation wasn't going to take these moves lying down. And man, look at them go. This is a big deal. You add that to like the Gramercy and the venues that they've already got in New York and Jason Miller and our friend Sean Striegel have got a couple things to work with Ron Delsner to make for an awesome lineup and compete matching up nicely with the Bowery AEG team. Dan, I'm wondering here how much of a difference this is going to crack. I mean, AEG and Bowery were so cemented into the fabric of the New York live culture, and the AEG acquisition is a huge play for AEG. But it's not just Swear, it's his team. But what does that really mean for Live Nation? It doesn't seem like a significant acquisition as it was with Glancy and everybody absorbing into the AEG system. Is this really going to have the impact for Live Nation New York that the Bowery guys acquisition had for AEG? It's apples and oranges. I mean, Bowery is the gold standard of cool in New York. They've got the venues and they've got the cool buyers. I mean, just on the top end, Glancy and Jomo. Jesus Christ, that's cool. Then you add them to Casey, Adam Weir, Mike Luba. Holy shit, that team is amazing. Deborah Rathwell on the high, you know? It's just like, that is a power team AEG has brought together in New York. Not to mention 
in the national touring cycle. But Live Nation has other venues. Like I said, they've got Gramercy. They've got a couple other rooms that they've always had in their hands. They've got an amazing team with Sean Striegel and Jason Miller and all the way down at the end of the hall. They got Delsner, man. Like, they're not empty-handed. Do they match up perfectly? I still give the advantage to AEG when it comes to the clubs and the theaters. When it goes to the arenas and bigger, power kind of lines to the national touring, and in this case, kind of falls to Live Nation, points Michael Rapino. So it depends on what level you're talking about. And in the middle of all that, you got to remember, Madison Square Garden has Radio City, they've got the Beacon, and of course, they've got the theater at the Garden on top of the Garden. So those are all open rooms. Swear was the co-founder of Mercury Lounge and Bowery Ballroom. Does that put the acquisition of both those rooms under Live Nation? How is this going to work out? It said joint the way I read that, and I believe that is the case, that it's not necessarily a buyout as much as a partnership. So we got to see how this plays out in days to come, but clearly Live Nation's got some cool in their back pocket. Well, I know that it was rumored for uh, some time that Swear's two venues had parted company with Bowery Presents in August, and this is just one of the most recent salvos in the venue battle happening in New York between AEG and Live Nation. I'm sure we're all going to stay tuned to see how it goes. Let's move on to some other news, my friend. It's a sad day to report Jack Boyle of Cellar Door Productions has died at age 83. Washington, D.C. concert promoter Giant founded Cellar Door Productions And they established such great venues as the Crazy Horse, the Bayou, the Cellar, and they really were paramount in opening up some of the early sheds. He really is an icon in this business, a Bill Graham-level name on the East Coast, and he'll be sadly missed. Dan, I want to give a shout-out to a friend of the podcast, Patty Ann Tarleton, who was a guest during Canadian Music Week this past year. She is the COO of Ticketmaster and the newest inductee of the Canadian Music Hall of Fame for Broadcast and Industry Awards, which will be happening in early 2018. Big congrats to Patty Ann. Everything she's accomplished. It's an amazing thing to come up with the family name under Donald K. Donald, DKD, and make your own path in this industry. And she is so respected and so well-loved. Big what up to our friend Patty Ann, who just rocks the mic. She's awesome. Hello, this is Dan Berkowitz from CID Entertainment and CID Presents, and I am here on Promoter 101. And finally, we want to take a moment to shine a spotlight on the badass of the not week, but the year. That's right, our 2017 Badass of the Year. And that's going to go out to APA's Andy Summers. He is the ultimate in cool. Always fair, works with all of the best talent in the business, from Social Distortion to Brian Wilson. He's a mentor to so many young people that have come up and turned out to be so great in the industry and continues to mentor, making him our 2017 Promoter 101 Badass of the Year. Congratulations, Andy. So well-deserved. Lucy Lawler Freese, Rival Entertainment and the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm on Promoter 101. It's the holidays on Promoter 101. This is the 12 days of Christmas, our very first day. Each day, we're going to be bringing a special guest to you over the holidays, and we're very excited to announce that the first guest during this holiday season is going to be Move Concerts, Phil Rodriguez, who's here today on Promoter 101 to share his success as a concert promoter in South America. Promoter 101, we are excited to have one of the biggest promoters in the world with us from Move Concerts, Phil Rodriguez. Thank you so much for taking the time, Phil. It's a pleasure to be with you, man. You guys are the precipice of what a major promoter is, and you guys are rocking throughout the world. I mean, talking like Justin B. WWE, Midnight Oil, major shows. We're a hardworking bunch of the Las the Mohicans. We're an independent concert promotion company. We're Latin America. And uh, yeah, we're, we're burning all cylinders here, man. Seems like good things are going on. And you're talking about some major shows and major acts. As far as your place in that world, is development a big part of that too? Or is it just such a major push when an act gets to that level and so expensive, you have to wait till they become a bigger pop star or stadium level act? Well, it's a little bit of both. We're doing the South American run for Ed Sheeran. We did his first run. We're doubling or tripling the capacities from the first time through. Obviously, great artist to work with, and he just delivered a huge album. That helps. Justin, we've worked with him since the first time he was down there. Midnight Oil is just something close to my heart. I took him the first time to Brazil about 1988 or 1989, and to me, they were one of the great live bands of all time. And when I heard they were reforming, I mean, the agent reached out to me. I said, count me in. I don't want to miss this. WWE, it's a relationship we started last year. We did two dates with them. This year we're doing five, and hopefully we'll be building from that. How big is wrestling down there? 
You know what? We Last year, the two dates that we did, which was in Lima, Peru, and in Quito, Ecuador, they both sold out. As most people know it's, it's a family show. I mean, you'll, you'll have the dad coming over with his kids and whatever. So, uh, And obviously, there's massive support from their television programming and from the company. Uh, so, so far, it's been a, a win-win with, the, with this event. Is that arenas or is that stadiums? Well, you know what? One of the things that we sorely lack in Latin America, with very few exceptions, obviously outside of Mexico, which is well-developed in terms of venues, Chile that has Movistar Arena, and Rio, which has a few arenas, and particularly some that were built previously for the Pan American Games or for the Olympics, were horrible with arenas. So, I mean, if, for instance, we're doing it in an amphitheater in a lovely shed, a world-class shed that was built in Costa Rica. We're doing it there. In Lima, we do it outdoor. We build the whole ring and lights and trusses and everything. In Buenos Aires, we're doing it at Luna Park, which is an indoor venue, old one, but it's a historic venue in, in Argentina. And that's the go-to place when you want to go indoor. It's a capacity of 7,400. Anything it takes. You guys get creative to make it happen. We have to be. You know, we have to be. And as independents, we have to look at all the opportunities that are out there. And if we think it's going to work. We have to go for it. I mean, it's, I don't have to tell you, it's a new world out there and changing all the time uh, with live nations and AG and this and that. So we have to be proactive and try to see what makes sense and what we, we think will do the business. Now, you've been called the Michael Rapino of Latin America. Does that ring true to you? Uh, no, I wish. I think more like the Christopher Columbus of, uh, of South America. I mean, I started out, first thing I ever did was in April of 1977. I like to think, uh, well, I don't like to think. The reality is I was the schmuck with the machete in my hand cutting through the bushes way back when. It was a, it's been a long, hard climb and uh is that a metaphor or did that actually happen it's a metaphor but it felt like that it felt like that's what was happening uh, back in the day it was rough but you know a lot of people along the way helped out certain opportunities came up that made sense and that's where i cut my teeth and that's where the path started opening up and becoming a bit more consistent it's a, a long story but i mean in 77 it was very tough but i mean the world's changed now you have artists need to tour have to be out there the markets become a worldwide market whether it's south america Asia, South Africa, the Middle East, all these places that 30 years ago, 35, 40 years ago were no-go are now part of the normal touring cycle. You live in America. You're based in Florida. You obviously must commute down to cover shows and oversee your investment quite a bit. Quite a bit. I mean, actually, I was an airline brat. My father worked for Pan American Airlines back in the day. So I went to high school in Brazil. And, you know, that's one of the things that stuck in my head. I, when I was down there, I would have to get on a plane to come see a show back in the day. And I would always say, well, you know, think to myself, what are we, a colony of leopards? Why doesn't anybody ever come down here? I kind of fell backwards into this. First thing I ever did was the Jackson 5 in Caracas, Venezuela. I always say I've been scratching my way to the bottom ever since. <laughs> Lived in Brazil, as I said. I've been the past. I also kept an apartment there, but a regional office is in Miami. Even though we're independents, we have the largest footprint down there. We have an office in Sao Paulo, an office in Buenos Aires, an office in Lima, Peru, an office in Bogota, an office in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I just found that having our little headquarters here in Miami makes sense. We have multiple flights all over Latin America. I kind of get a bird's eye view of the whole region. I'm not absorbed by the reality of one particular country. But yeah, I travel to all the markets at least three or four times a year easy. And that's got to be just an exciting thing for some of these acts because most of them have probably never been there, at least the first time in. So you're really giving an act a tour of the world, at least the Latin world, and showing them things that they'll never see otherwise. Well, you know what? One of the things that the artists find out when they go down is uh, the crowds are extremely enthusiastic there because, first of all, you have the Latin passion. But second of all, they're really grateful and they show it. I mean, I'm not disrespecting any of the audiences. And you have exciting audiences everywhere in the world without a shadow of a doubt. You know, sometimes if you've had something for 40, 50 years on your plate, you don't appreciate it as much as somebody where it's been something for the last 10 or 15 years. And something that I always say, in, particularly in markets where you have have a lower per capita and so forth, going to a concert is a luxury that people can afford, you know, particularly middle class, lower middle class and so forth down there. So for them going to a show is just a combination of everything. They're going to see an artist that they like. It's a great night out. It's a somewhat of a unique thing. It's not a place where you're going to have 20 shows a week to choose from at every level, whether it's club or whatever. So yeah, they bring 
a certain luggage to a concert that makes it really exciting, electric, they, uh, and the artists pick up on that. So you're maybe selling more tickets for an artist because it's a genre of lifestyle that's coming. There's not going to be four other acts of the same genre competing in that style in a given month period. In general, that's absolutely right. There are some moments where the traffic just becomes insane, particularly because I'm not going to say it's seasonal, but obviously May through August, let's say, the traffic is heavier in North America and Europe and so forth because it's summer, the festivals, the amphitheaters. And then, let's say, from September through early December, traffic gets heavy in South America. Same thing in Australia, same thing in, in South Africa and so forth. And then we pick up again, say, February through May. So sometimes you'll have a little bit too much traffic or more than we would like, but that's the way it is. And it's like that everywhere. But yeah. So you're doing stadium shows in multiple countries. Does the production exist down there? Does the steel to build those stages and stadiums live down there? Or is that stuff you're having to bring in? Uh, no, we normally work. I mean, unless it's, you know, U2 or Roger Waters with the wall or, or something like that. Most artists deal with the inventory, the production inventory that's down there. Obviously, as the years go by, it keeps on getting better and better and better. It's a matter of investments, a high investment uh, for the production companies down there. Because remember, not only do you have the freight, but a lot of these countries have very high duties and so forth. But it goes hand in hand. As you have more artists touring, the production level is going to go up. The quality of the gear that's available becomes more available and so forth. To me, the next step is to have better venues. In North America, it's been now obviously happening in Europe and in Australia and Japan. Once you started getting the world-class arenas and so forth, it really changes the entertainment experience. Just a quick story. I have a dear friend of mine in Brazil, extremely wealthy, well-traveled, and he's got a home here in Miami. He once went to see a show, and, and he came back. I'm not mention the artist. He goes, man, that was the best show I ever saw in my life. And I go, wow, well, yeah, it's a great show, and you saw a full-on production, but do you think it really was the best show you ever saw? And he goes, well, you know what? I've never been to an arena, and you know, in America. And I go, you got to be kidding me. I mean, you've traveled the world. He goes, no, I've never been to an arena. So, I mean, I always say that story because it kind of changed the whole experience of going versus where you got to go to a crap or old arena, you got to park far away, you got to walk. When we do stadiums, the punters, uh, the fans have to walk a half a mile to a mile from where they park. So it makes it rough. And that's, again, that goes back to my earlier point. They have, sometimes they have to go through so many hurdles. And when they get there, they just go berserk. They have a blast. It makes sense. And it's definitely more of an experience in that scenario. So Shows just seem to be a commonplace thing, especially when you're talking about in America, we have the summer of the mega ticket now where people are buying seasons of six or eight tickets on a single block and everyone's competing with seven or eight shows a night. It definitely makes it more of a novelty. I mean, over here, it's like going to the mall. It's so easy. And we have a lot of work when we work down there because remember, we get involved in the hotels, the ground transportation, getting the visas for the artists, the production, obviously the advertising, selling tickets, trying to bring in sponsorship, which is very important down there. There. It's a very important component. Uh, I mean, it is everywhere, but down there, it's a vital component to any deal, simply because there are a lot of elements that you count on in North America or even in Europe that you don't have down there, whether it's your food and beverage, whether your per capita is higher here, whether it's the merch or whether it's the parking. Obviously, without even getting into the different tiers of ticket pricing and the VIP packages and all that, that's very rare there. Sponsorship also helps mitigate a lot of the fluctuations that we'll have with the currency, which Latin America will uh, will have a lot more fluctuations than I would say even Europe. So, yeah, we have a lot on our plate every time we do a show. It isn't just, I'll see you at the venue and load in at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. and we go from there. Well, certainly the difference in the economy and the value of the dollar and the fluctuation between each different country has got to be something that you just have to really know what you're doing with. You have to be an economist almost to play this game. Well, I've always said that businessmen from South America have to be very sharp and among the best in the world because there's so many variables that you have to deal with. The fluctuations with the currency, you try to project. I mean, in some cases, if you have a really big show or event, you might consider hedging. So at least you have a fixed exchange rate. It's an expensive proposition, so that you really need to get that right. And then the politics. I mean, for instance, I don't have to tell you, Brazil right now is going through a huge scandal, let's say, with politics and corruption and the 
and, and so forth, and that creates a climate of uncertainty in terms of where we're going. For instance, presidential elections next year, they still don't know who the candidates are going to be. So, yeah, you have so many variables, and you kind of try to do your best in predicting. And, you know, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. You were hoping the exchange rate was going to be higher, and it's lower than you estimated. So it's a win-win, not only for us, but for the artists when it comes time for a settlement. But, yeah, it's a tricky road. Well, and being in a second world country, it seems like corruption could be a problem and could get in the way with governments in some cases. And to protect your investment, it seems like you'd have to get kind of creative sometimes. In the past, it was more so. Now it's pretty much a straight ahead game. The one thing that is difficult sometimes, and I always say sometimes we work in the in the world of bizarro, is that they'll go from ext- they'll go to extremes. I'll give you an example. Um, I think about a year and a half ago, two years ago, two or three kids that died due to drug overdose or they took some bad drug at an EDM festival. Well, the government went out and said, we, we're going to ban anything that's electronic or DJs or whatever. We had a show with Kraftwerk indoor at the Luna Park. They wanted to consider that EDM. We finally got the show to go forward and, and appealed and press was in an uproar because it was just silly. Kraftwerk is the grandfathers to a certain degree of this, but you know, it's a whole different audience, a different vibe. So like we say down there, sometimes they go from zero to 200 in a second without taking a step back and really studying what went wrong. Now, what can we do to improve it so this doesn't happen in the past? Instead of just, okay, we're going to ban it. So that's kind of the silly stuff or the stupid stuff that we have to deal with sometimes. And, and you know, always hoping that it'll be better in the future and trying to do our best to uh, so it doesn't happen again. But yeah, it's uh, a lot of balls in the air sometimes. Are the systems in place down there that you have real ticketing systems like Ticketmaster where you're pulling a real audit? Are you still dealing with hoping the ticket sales are right and doing it through back channel to get them out there to the fans like the old school record store days? No, we have proper ticketing companies in every market, obviously some better than others. The technology exists down there across the board, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, nowadays it's all software, so it's so accessible that, yeah, I mean, the days of hard tickets and counting the dead wood and all that stuff, those days are over. Stuart Ross was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago telling us about still weighing the tickets in parts of Russia. I did that in South America. We've done that. Yeah, we have big baggies full of ticket stubs and, and that was it. We counted 500, 500, 500, averaged out the weight of each little bundle of 500 ticket stubs and, and then took the whole bunch of tickets and started weighing them. And you know what? It worked. We came within two or 300 tickets of the actual uh, Deadwood. And it was a show for, I think it was 35, 40,000 people. So, if you, you know, your margin of error was 300 tickets, more or less. Not bad. See, I guess if all the tickets are the same price, it works that way. If you're, you're scaling a house, it's kind of different. But yeah, how some of the world is coming in. Yeah, but this was back in the day. Now, that said, the whole thing ha- that you have access to in North America now with all the information, all the data mining that you have, all the analytics and so forth, it's just absolutely fascinating. We'll get there because that's, like I said, the software, the technical parts, of it's easier to import and adapt. But we're not even close to uh, the amount of information that promoters have at their fingertips here in North America. It's insane. Well, it seems like some of these countries in Latin America have a huge differential between the upper upper class and the lower class and not so much middle class. It seems like selling a large number of tickets would be a huge issue. You know what I've always said? Our primary market, particularly for international rock, pop, whatever, is your upper class, middle class, and lower middle class. Normally, your lower class will be listening to either samba, whatever, salsa, reggaeton. And I don't want to be stereotypical about it, but more or less, that's your rule of thumb. And I've always said the guy paying the top end ticket helps subsidize the lower end ticket. So I'll give you an example. Lima, Peru will have our top end tickets. They may be, for the sake of argument, $150. But a low-end tickets will be $17, $22, $24. So that $150 helps subsidize so a punter that can only afford $20 or $17 can go to a show also. So we cover all the bases. Everybody can get in and have an experience and enjoy it and move the tickets in every sector of the venue. We want to be able to have everybody come into the show if at all possible. Brazil, we have an insane situation, which is really going to be hard to get away from. We're trying to, and there's a group of different promoters that uh, we're chipping in to see we can lobby about this, which is years back they came up with a student discount of 50%, which is insane. There is no discount. So what happens is 40% of your ticket inventory has to be sold at 50% discount to any band that has a valid student ID from the National Student Union. So when we work on the scaling, we have to figure out how 
how to make that 40% on the whole other t- on, on the tickets that have a whole price. I mean, not only is it stupid, it's not fair, but you end up with some extremely high ticket prices to compensate for that 50% discount. I mean, you know, it's the eternal question. You know, it's who pays the bill at the end of it. So um, that's only in Brazil. But it's become so ingrained because this is almost like a political thank you and payback that a president named Fernando Collor years back gave to the student union when they went out to the streets and demonstrated on his behalf. And it's going to be hard to get rid of. We're trying to see how we can modify it or something. But again, one of the crazy things that happens in the world of Bizarro. The Rock and Rio Festival takes place in Brazil. That must take a ton of the bands out of the market and obviously really screw up traffic for the time being on top of that. Is festivals also another problem across all of Latin America, or is that kind of a standalone? Uh, no, it, you have Rock in Rio, which is every two years, so that'll flood the market with some artists that month of September, and then you have Lollapalooza, which is every year, so in terms of the, I'm not going to say the indie space, because they cover a lot of musical genres, but they definitely create a bit of traffic in the month of March, uh, but other than that, we, we don't have the flood of festivals that you currently have in, in the U.S. or Europe. Pretty crazy. It's, it's definitely a European and American issue right now, but it definitely seems like it's on the move. Oh, yeah, and growing by the day. To be able to keep track of the different markets has got to be just an insane practice. The different economies, the different countries, the back and forth with immigration. That's a juggling act on a whole nother level. It is to a certain degree. You kind of get used to it. They all have their different reality. I mean, they really do. And and it happens. And I understand what happens. But a lot of people say, oh, it's South America. This will work. And it's not really. It's different tastes, different realities in different markets. Some things work in Brazil that don't work anywhere else. Some things work in Lima that don't work any, in, in Peru that don't work anywhere else. Some things work in Argentina that don't work anywhere else. So you have different realities. You have to kind of uh, work along and take advantage of them. That's one of the good things about being able to be in all these different territories. I mean, we don't necessarily have to do an artist in all the markets. We can just go to the markets where something makes sense or just do that market. Crazy example, Peru has just a certain niche market, somewhere between two to 3,000, 4,000 tickets, certain bands from the 80s. doesn't work anywhere else. I mean, in July, we're doing a small 3,000 seater with psychedelic furs. The market is there, and we're able to uh, to do that sort of stuff and uh, that sort of artist in Peru. But urban will work more in Brazil than in other markets. So, yeah, it's one of the good things of being able to be in all these different markets is that. that it opens up our spectrum in terms of what we can do and, and keep busy and, and hopefully make some money. Excellent. I want to thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us on Promoter 101 today. Thank you, Phil. All right. It's a pleasure. Take care, mate. Move Concerts is doing amazing business under the leadership of Phil Rodriguez, clearly a company on the move on the international stage. Hey, what's going on? This is Bubbles. This is Julian. And this is Ricky. You're listening to Promoter 101. <laughs> Dan, it's a short week again, too, but you had some things to say on Twitter, and it's about that time of the podcast where we go through what was going through your mind when you wrote each of these Promoter 101 tweets. Let's hit this one. At any given moment, my career is somewhere on the quote-unquote Jerry Maguire spectrum. Seriously, this is my life as it is. Just any given moment, taking that world of greed versus opportunity out of doing the right thing for everybody. It's a constant fight. And I'm sure everyone that listens to the podcast knows this course of business, and I'm sure you all feel it with me. Why don't we end it there for Promoter 101 tweets? You can follow Dan on Twitter. He's at the Jew. And if you have your own Promoter 101 thoughts, feel free to tweet them at us or email them over. Anything that makes us smile will get used on the air. Yo, this is Tommy Lee. Yeah, that T Lee. And you're listening to Promoter 101. Fucking turn this shit up, bitches. If you want to reach out to us, you can send us an email to steiny at promoter101.net. You can reach any of us there, and we promise to get back to you in a timely manner. We know you need your fix of Promoter 101 during the holidays, and we don't want you jonesing. So for the next 11 days, we're going to continue to bring you our 12 days of Christmas. That's 11 more gifts, 11 special interviews you've never heard before. So come join us tomorrow. We'll be giving you a new surprise and continuing on each and every single day to the 31st. Again, it'll be a new interview you've never heard before. Something short and sweet, something for you to listen to each and every day during the holidays. It's our gift to you. And until then, we wish you sold out shows. 
Cheers. Hey, it's Mark David. Steve Strange. Toby Leighton Pipe. Stuart Galbraith. Simeon Galperin. I'm Ralph James. Ted Cohen. Julia Frank. Jeff Goodman. Jamie Adler. And Frank Wing. Doug Edley. David Klein. Stephen Riff. Tom Chauncey. And, and we're, we're on, on Promoter 101. 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Let's have some fun. Christmas.